and to stay away from the coasts. That's it for now. More in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Des Kelly Interiors. Delivering your new bed, mattress or furniture in time for Christmas. DesKelly.ie Off the ball. Thanks to Screwfix.ie. Championing the trade with a dedicated call centre. This, this is News Talk. And you're very welcome along to Thursday night's Off the Ball. Richie McCormack here with you tonight. Don't worry, we'll be heading down to University Concert Hall in Limerick just after half past seven with Ronan O'Gara, Brian O'Driscoll and Keith Wood alongside Nathan to look ahead to the start of this season's Heineken Champions Cup. Team news from Leinster, of course, today. We'll get to that momentarily. And after half nine tonight as well, we will have Thursday night football a little bit late with John Giles. The man himself sat down with Nathan and we'll play that out to you just after half nine. As I say, you can get in contact tonight. 53106 for 30 cent is the number. You can also tweet us at Off The Ball. Uh, joining me tonight in studio for the news round, which is brought to you uh, with Screwfix.ie. Championing the tray with a choice of over 20,000 quality tray products is Mulligan to my O'Hare, Oats to my hull. It is Kieran Cunningham of the Irish Daily Star. Beavis to your butthead. Uh, yeah. You've got the better hair if you're Beavis. Right. I'm being quite honest about that. And you are also Cornholio. So that's you've got that going for you. Okay. That's where we're at in International Week. We mentioned Beavis and Butthead and Mulligan and O'Hare. Yeah, can we fast forward 26 minutes? Because we just decided before we went down there there's nothing to talk about. Well, the kind of... I'm not gonna, I'm not going to lie, right? There was one moment of productivity in this afternoon's office whereby the under-21s game had ended mm-hmm. and conversation had then turned to... Uh, do you remember the Indoor League with Fred Truman, which is repeated on one of the... Oh, yeah, Indoor Sports. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was repeated on one of the uh, satellite channels. So we sat there watching arm wrestling from 1977 with commentators using terms about some of the contestants that you definitely cannot use yeah, in television yeah. anymore. And then also looking at the greatest hits of Lisa Stansfield around the year 1991. Right. So that's where we are in International Week. Yeah, well, the, like I was so desperate to find something to write about or talk about, so I was just Googling birthdays, and then like, Seamus Coleman and Joe Canning are both 30 today, okay? That's, that shocked me when I saw that. Yeah, because they, for some reason I think of them, particularly Canning, I still think of him as being very young. I know Coleman was a late, late, relatively late bloomer, but... But even like, still, they're, they're still into their final team. couple of laps now, and you and, think it's hard to believe. And Canning is hyper-aware of that, it seems. Like, his yeah. interview with Joe not long ago, and not long after the All-Ireland final, he was speaking in terms of realisation that he's into the final chapter. Now, he's not saying he's in his final year, yeah, not by yeah. any means, but he knows now that he's on the home straight, and he's probably yeah. into well, the he had, three, No, he had at least one career-threatening injury. Like, he's talked very openly about that, how... When the hamstring was ripped off the bone, so you know he's had he's had to deal with a, a few heavy knocks. But I was just thinking about that. I was looking back at that day. They were both born right thirty years ago, October eleventh, nineteen eighty eight. Arguably the greatest day ever. Now the first ep- first episode of Nighthawks was on that day. With and actually, Jay you Healy. mentioned yeah, you mentioned Giles. There's a great Giles and Dunphy uh, clip of of them on. Uh, they've had a few sherbets and they're on Nighthawks one night. One of those. We're taking it up on YouTube. But the other one oh. is. Uh, because I've always wanted to get you a music trivia question. Oh, God. Uh, this was an Irish Act for. number one single that day Yeah. and album. Right. Two, the uh, Irish Acts were number one, uh, the number one single and album in the UK that day. What were they? Oh, God. Um, do, do you know what? Something says 88 Hot House Flares is going to be one of them? No. Damn it. Well, the single was You Two Desire. Right. You'll never get the album. Oh, God. 88 album. And, and yeah. No, Christaberg. Uh, Good Lord. I can't remember, I can't remember what it was called. You surely can't. Okay. Big it probably, had like, probably had Lady in Red, in, in Red on it. it was number one, so. Yeah, but there we are. Into and the day after, uh, uh, I don't think this was a coincidence either, Pope John Paul II addressed the European Parliament. <laughs> Ian Paisley turned up heckling him, calling him the Antichrist, and had to be escorted oh, out. Oh, God, I remember so that, This yeah. was a day after Coleman and Canning were born, so it wasn't a coincidence. So you're saying... This triggered something in the world. Paisley was shook... There was a <laughs> lightning crack. He knew it was coming down the track. The skies did part out west. The west of Ireland gave us two great sons that day. Yeah. And uh, they were the forms of Canning and, and, and Coleman. But it is, like, in terms of Coleman, obviously he's missing this week uh, through injury for the games with Denmark and Wales. Yeah, we mentioned in terms of like Canning being in the final stage of his career. Coleman is as well. That move that has been so long mooted for Coleman away from Everton and just never came to pass. You kind of think now... It won't the chances happen, of that is now no, gone. It won't happen. I think 
Like you look at the top clubs, when did they buy someone, a player over 27, 28? Like there's the odd exception, like Alexis Sanchez going to... And look how well that's worked. Zlata, yeah, or Zlatan, and you could argue, make the same point there. But generally the, they look at resale value and they look at getting three or four good years. So I think that injury, like the, I, know, I know there was genuine interest from United and... Uh, and was fairly, it? fairly, there's fairly, there's good reason to believe Bayern Munich were had a look at him, but that was when he was 27, 28. No, the bro- the broken leg just, mm. I think that scuppered any chance of that kind of move happening. More importantly, he would have been uh, Donegal centre back for a decade, but uh, <laughs> only for he went to law school to soccer. Uh, that yeah. stupid decision. What did he do that for? I know, crazy, absolutely crazy stuff. It is like he's part of that because we're going to think of Coleman as well as still being one of the younger members of the Ireland side. Yeah. And again, while yes, there are young players coming through into that squad and have gathered this week under Martin O'Neill, there is still a sense that it's possibly not enough. And you kind of look at today with the under-21s needing a win and instead losing 3-1 away to a bang average Israel side. And Kieran O'Hara, who has been on the books of Manchester United and was obviously called up to the squad in the summer for Ireland, making an absolute howler. You're kind of wondering where the next set are coming from. Well, it's that, a very hard thing for them you know, to progress. Yeah, because I think there's a, there's a huge amount of navel gazing going on at the, at the moment. And um, yeah, Richard Dunn had a big thesis in the Herald. Yeah, there, I saw that. You know, because they run a series like Crisis in Irish Football. But in a way, I think in a few years' time we could be looking back on this period and thinking, God, we used to have Seamus Coleman. He was a regular in the Premier League. He was a good player, and we had Robbie Brady and Jay Jay It could get a lot worse before it gets better. Because even no, there's an under nineteen crop at the moment, and a lot of people think they're you know they're decent. There's some good players there, like Troy Parrott, very young for that age group, but he's in there, he's Adam doing Ida. well. But you go back twenty years ago when Ireland won the under sixteen, under eighteen European Championships. Under eighteens, you got Richard Dunn and Robbie Keane, with only ones out of that team who had long international careers. A couple other, you know, decent careers. A couple mm. others got a few caps. Gary Doherty got a. Got probably most of those, and the same with the under six teams. Uh, you know, you got uh, John O'Shea, Andy Reid. Outside of that, Liam Miller got some caps. Uh, Jim Goodwin, maybe one or two. You know, but, uh, but from really good underage teams, if you get one or two, you're doing well. Mm. And 20 years ago, it was far, far easier to get into a Premier League team or a Championship team. 20 years on now, when the globalisation of the game has gathered is gathered up steam all the time. It's just, it's just so hard. Like the likes of Troy Parrott there. Like, how hard will it be for him to get a shot at the first team with Tottenham? Like, like the Harry it's Kane virtually thing, impossible. The, people will point towards the Harry Kane thing with Spurs from a yeah. few years back, but he essentially got in there by accident. Like, yeah. they were stuck for a couple of strikers that season. It was the year, his first goal, obviously. Uh, yeah, the senior and like the, the loan, loan spells at Millwall. And, and like, the, that's the, no, that's the thing about it. It often is by accident. You get a, you get a break, because you go back to Coleman. Coleman was at uh, Sligo Rovers and the manager didn't fancy him, was going to send him on loan to Finn Harps and Coleman has since said if that happened he was going to quit and play Gaelic football. But there was a change of manager, I think that's when Paul Cook came in. Paul Cook liked the look of him, give him a go. From there it all built, it went to Everton. Like you can just get a lucky break or you know, you just find the right manager who'll give you a chance. And so I, I think it's pretty bleak, you know. It's, there are positive things being done. The alignment of the league clubs with underage setups at under 15 level, I think, is going to end up being positive. I know we got an email in yesterday about they were looking for tenders essentially for under 13 mm. sides. So there are structures being there put are, in place. but I think the old pathway is broken. Like there are old pathways going to, the, to going to England or, or Scotland. Well, was never, ultimately, that was never going to be feasible in the in the long term. I think we squeaked a lot through it, and I think we did. But I think okay, we always kind of made the assumption that that would always be the case, but it, it's definitely not going to be the case. Because you look like the year and year how much you're dropping the amount of players you have in the Premier League Championship. Um, like, it's never going to go back up. So you have to, your only hope is to build domestic soccer. And the amount of investment that needs, and even the amount of the change in people's mindsets here that we even think of going to a game, is huge. Because mm. there is, like a, there is a, a minority there who are fanatical about the League of Ireland, and then there's a huge majority who pay no attention to it. Well, we'll get onto that as well. Um, Cause the FEI today welcomed plans by Dublin City Council to redevelop Daily Man Park. It sees the wheels after a little bit of stalling have been set in motion for this one. And uh, the spiritual home of Irish football is going to see the construction of a new 6,000 all-seater stadium. For those of you who are streaming us online, uh, you'll be able to see a bit of this now. There's going to be an interactive museum as part of the proposal and the redeveloped ground uh, will be shared by Bohemians and Shelburne and both Dublin clubs have also praised the proposals. Looking like they showed the video, we're seeing it now on screen as well uh, today. The setup, if it does come to pass, and obviously 
there are big ifs in terms of planning in uh, in Ireland. Like it's going to be a fantastic facility. It's exactly the kind of thing that there needs to be more of. I know they yeah. they knock back essentially the proposal that was going to be in in Chicor for St Pat's to build on a shopping centre, and there are probably reasons for that, and they're going to go through the processes of appealing that as well. But looking at that today, like that's going to be a remarkable facility, clean, neat, yeah. all seater, full 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 sides, full four sides, uh, which there hasn't been a daily event for a number of years. Having a facility like that close enough to the city centre of Dublin and in a community as engaged potentially as, you know, the burgeoning Dublin 7 area yeah. um, and obviously down to Cabra and, and Finglas and all that, like to have that up and running in four or five years' time is going to be superb. Yeah, and see, that's essential. Like, if you do want to build the league, if you do want to make it the alternative pathway to, crea- to creating players that can play for international football for Ireland, you have to invest heavily in bricks and mortar. Mm. And people won't put up with what they used to put up with because people have travelled now. They've gone to Stadia Abroad, they've gone to the Aviva, they've gone to Crow Park. Like a lot of the GA Stadia are, full, are substandard, but there's a handful of them that are decent now. And people don't want to go to a ground where you're scraping bird shit off the seats or you know, there's really basic toilet mm. facilities or there's not, uh, there's not much in the detail to the burger vans. Like you go to, like the RDS isn't state-of-the-art ground where, Le- where Leinster play uh, the, uh, most, of the rugby, rugby, yeah. most of the rugby games. But you go in there, like it's a comfortable, like there's lots of decent food and coffees, mm-hmm. coffee, um, coffee, whatever, whatever, kiosks or whatever. The bars are decent, you know, there's just, they make it a comfortable experience for you. And, and people want that now and expect that. And I think, you know, y- you have to go that way. Like it's a long-term investment to, to, put, to put money into that rather than your squad or... Or how you balance the two, like you have to balance the two to an extent, but it's uh, like that's where you'd want the FAI to come in. But like, have they got the money? Have they got the will? More importantly, it's the money. I think is going to be the uh, the the key thing here. Um, John has texted us on five three one six saying, "I live in Loch Nine and said Dublin County Council wants to take the pitches off for football club, which has been here for nearly forty years, little or no investment in soccer. When you compare it to Ballyboden GA Club, it seems soccer is treated as an amateur sport by the people who run it. There's also an element as well that the clubs." need to do a lot of fundraising on their own yeah. and I know um, essentially Bows have been good for that I know from personal experience I've been around the club they've done a lot of good work themselves in terms of self-promotion Sean Grover's doing the exact same St. Pat's have improved as well and we see the likes of commercial directors going into GA setups into county setups it's kind of something like that you need but again it's finding the money to kind of pay for these people it just doesn't exist out of thin air yeah and, try, and trying to make money as things stand out of Irish football like uh, I'd say to Dundalk and Cork, like who's managing to do it the last few years? Like it's, mm. and that's so that's why you know you have a huge sympathy for clubs. If they, I'm sure all the clubs want better facilities and they want better, you know, they want to improve their squads, etc. But uh, <laughs> unless you get uh, an Abramovich coming in here, where are you going? You know? Yeah, it's a it's a it's worrying. Um, I guess that we're in that kind of period of stasis at the moment. Um, we're also in the down period in terms of looking ahead to, to inter-county stuff. Uh, the draw for the football championship is going to be made tonight. You yeah. pumped, Kieran? You ready I for this? Pumped. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's actually one of the great expressions. Uh, Michal Amor they coined it a few years ago, and I think it was after Paddy O'Shea and the animals comment that mm. caused all the trouble, but he, could, he dismissed it as winter talk. And winter talk dominates the GA now because... Inter-county action is squeezed into a pretty short period. Well, no, the championship is. It's essentially like uh, the NFL. Yeah. And it's, it's all focused around yeah. a very small time of the year, but it's like the be-all and end-all yeah. as long so as it's there. Yeah, so then like last winter, you know, you had maybe 27 gigs in a row where Dean Rock was asked about a free kick from a few months earlier. You got a bit, I think even poor Dean, even though he was probably getting a few quid for it, yeah. a bit fed up with it after a while. But now you've got endless chatter about rules that might never actually be even trialed. And now you're going to have uh, trying to hype up a draw for games that, g- given the rate of climate change, we'll probably all be dead by the time these games come around. You're one of the liberal media elite. Apparently so, uh, snowflake. You, yeah, do you know any reason why these happen so early? Have you got any knowledge no, of the well, insights? The, the only thing I've ever been told is county boards like having time to plan their calendars and their fixtures. But, ha- like, but why? You, you said this to me outside. They're able to organise qualifiers in a couple of space, Ad-hoc. like in a couple of days. So why do you need nine months to to 
get ready for a game. Like, it's just, it's nonsense. Is this baby planning territory? Is that where yeah. they are? And the other thing is, you're going to know, like, okay, we're going to be playing in May in either first, second, third weekend, whatever, anyway. So, you know, this is, I, I don't get it. Do they think it gives them a lift? The other thing is, <laughs> most of it is already decided. Most of it is already decided, Richie. That's the thing. Like, uh, we effectively know Cork and Kerry are being separated in, in, in yeah, Munster. Munster. We know that uh, New York are going to host Mayo, and I think London are hosting Galway mm. in football. Yeah. We know four quarterfinals in this year, or is it four semifinals in Leinster this year? 2018 semifinals, Dublin Carlisle. Yeah, they go straight into the quarterfinals. Quarter yeah. So the only, and then hurling is obviously round robin. So, so there's it's nothing just actually being done. Again. It's only Ulster. This is all basically about the Ulster Football Championship. That's it. I, I, the be all and end all, as we know of every summer, is the Ulster Football Championship. Everything goes back to you with the Ulster Football Championship, isn't it? Whether it's a Coleman chat or whether it's not really. No, I, I, I've kind of uh, I've gone a bit off the Ulster Championship to be honest. How come? It's just, uh, it's not what it was. Are you tired of the rounds? You've got two years in a row. Tyrone hammered everybody out of sight last year. This year, Donegal hammered everybody out of sight. So, it's, you know, it's just not what it was. Like, the, the, this old notion that everybody can beat everybody else in Ulster, it hasn't been that case in a while. Mm. Like, Tyrone, you know, obviously this year, the, the factor was um, Tyrone beat, uh, Monaghan beat Tyrone, and then Monaghan was shocked by Fermanagh. So that kind of shook everything up, but... But the reality was it just it made for made it into even more of a damn squib than it might have been. Well, what was once the only competitive championship in football is now a damn squib according to Kieran Cunningham. Tonight is just a complete waste of time. Yeah, so is life really. When you the more you Jesus think about it. Jesus Christ. Right. Anyway, um we're looking ahead, of course, to the Champions Cup um coming up after half past seven, of course, down in Limerick. Uh, the return of Johnson Sexton would have nine changes made to the Leinster side for tomorrow night's Champions Cup opener with Wasps. The other changes to the backseat, Gary Ringrose, Jordan Armour and Luke McGrath come into the side. There's an all-new front row as well of Keane Healy, Sean Cronin and Tyke Furlong with Josh van der Feer and Jack Conan starting in the back row. Such is Leinster's embarrassment of riches, there's no room for Reese Ruddock in the match day 23. And Leo Cullen was asked about his tough selections today. Yeah, well, it's competitive anyway. You know, depends on how you define tough. Uh, lots of guys disappointed, yeah, for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's 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 uh, you know the backroom team have worked incredibly hard, making sure we all the players are managed well. Um, you know, so a lot of time and effort and care has gone into making sure we've as many players available to select as possible. So you know the work that goes on in the background, away from the actual rugby side of things, um, is is massive for us. You know, with, with a big group that we have, and you know the demands that is placed upon them as well. So um, we hope we've managed the guys well, so they're. They're peaking at this time of the year. Such is their strength and depth, Leinster. Uh, Adam Byrne and Dave Carney are starting for Leinster A tomorrow night against Munster at Donnybrook. Both of them are internationals. Mm. They're now getting to the stage where they're almost like Chelsea, where they're so stocked <laughs> with players, they're going to start sending them out on loan yeah. just to kind of keep game time in their legs and stuff. It's well, it's not effectively what, what they've done with Joey Carberry. So. <laughs> well, we laugh, but you know, yeah. I don't think there's any real doubt that where he'll be once Jonathan Sexton decides to, yeah. to hang up the boots. But it's just a bizarre case whereby... The case of Leinster and the case of provincial rugby full stop is a remarkable success story. It's actually one, when we talk about the League of Ireland and football in this country, it's one that could be copied, or it could be at least learned from, if not copied. Yeah. The way that these... Brand, when we hate, I, I hate to say it in terms of sport, but the way the brands have been built, yeah. and then the infrastructure that's gone in around them as well. Has yeah, been yeah because like back in the day, I co uh, like early 90s, I covered rugby inter pros, and like literally there was there three men in a dog. There was nobody at them. Like the All Ireland League then kind of took off for a few years. There was reasonable crowds, like say the Young Monster game or Gary Owen or maybe Wanderers or you know, St Mary's here when they were going well. But generally, uh, uh, the reason it took off was, as you say, a rebranding and a restructuring, but it was very radical because it effectively sidelined the league, and the league mm. became very much not even a secondary competition. Like it's, gone, you know, it's it's really dropped down in importance in, in terms of cr crowd appeal. So I think if you were to market the League of Ireland and change the way people's perception of the League of Ireland, you probably would have to change it radically as well. You know, I don't know what kind of structure you would probably have to drop a few clubs. Like you probably have to. Concentrating on the elite. The idea that eight, eight, eight or nine. I, I don't think that's a bad idea, and the, well, I think it's one that's been floated around. But again, it's one that a lot of people would be protective of. You're not going to essentially vote for you know it's, it's Turkey's voting for Christmas essentially yeah. in that you're not going to have people uh, deciding that they're going to fold or going to be consumed into another club. 
that conversation is going to happen around Shelburne yeah, and Bohemians, I, for instance. I, I always wonder, Richie, like w- w- when when it was proposed that Wimbledon moved to Dublin, I think it was ninety five. <laughs> there was huge opposition Don't to that here, particularly the with the League of Ireland. No, but I'm just curious. What would have happened? I wonder, would we be any worse off or would we be healthier now if we'd had a Premier League club in Dublin? Because it's hard to argue we'd be worse off. Yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd go along with you there. I'd, it's just such a freakish and outlandish idea, mm. even though it is kind of still also imaginable. Yeah. But I just can't think of what actually would have happened with them here. No. I, just, I, just, I can't think of the circumstances of, of a Manchester United and Liverpool and whomever else, or even down in Championship and League One. But that's what I mean. It would have been, you know, it would have been even more radical than what the, the transformation of Leinster Monster. Like, if you suddenly had a team called, whatever they were going to be called, Dublin Dons v Manchester United at the Bertie Bowl... <laughs> <laughs> Aircon Park. Yeah, bring back the boom. Yeah, the boom was getting boomier, and you all blew it. Yeah, they were all. It's good crack the boom uh, for the time that it lasted as well. I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> if you were there, you don't remember. Exactly. Uh, loads of texts in, especially around the uh, the, the notion of. Uh, clubs here in Ireland as well. Hi guys, it's all well and good that Daily Mount is being developed, but does it not highlight the lack of ambition that it's only a 6,000 capacity? If soccer really is to prosper, they have to build and dream of it bigger. When you compare it to Connacht building a 12,000 capacity stadium, they're the smallest of the rugby teams. There is something in that, but again, you kind of have to manage what you have. Yeah, like I thought that earlier when I saw it was six, I thought that's too small, but the more I think about it, I can see the logic. Like, I'd be real, like how often are Connacht going to fill? Uh, going to need 12,000 capacity. That was the argument that was put out there by Martin Brenny during the week that why do Connacht need a rugby stadium because they're not pitch up in Pierce Park. Yeah. I doubt there's Galway fans in terms of GA are that fond of Pierce yeah. Park anymore. Well, uh, like, uh, to stadium, me, I, I, I would rather go to watch Bowes when it's packed to capacity at 6,000 than go to a 15,000 capacity uh, 15,000 capacity ground with eight, with 10,000 people there. No, it, it, no everybody it, prefers a packed ground. We think of the, the Limerick plane in Thomond the year that they were there before Marcus yeah. Field was reopened. I mean, that was just a nightmare. I mean, essentially, you're like, oh, wow, Limerick are playing in Thomond Park. Yeah. There's about 12 people there. Yeah. And it, it, there's a sense that there's 12 people there in an empty ground. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it goes back to the thing. Like, I, I, I love watching the Dublin Hurlers in Parnell Park because it's packed. And, mm. like, what does it hold? Nine, nine, ten thousand, 10,000, you know. But you put them into Croke Park, and even if there's 30,000 there, it's absolutely dead. Yeah, lads, I don't know what programme Lens Rugby and Irish Rugby in general have put in place to bring young players through to the senior level, but surely the FAI need to mimic this uh, because they've had amazing results. Yeah, there absolutely is uh, a lot in that as well. Uh, another text was saying there were 13 non English, Irish, Scottish, or Welsh players in the first day of the Premiership. If Ronnie Whelan was playing today, would he end up with Bolton in the Championship? Well, I don't that, think there's any doubt. I, I've always be lucky made, if he did. Yeah, I've always uh, made that argument because you will have people say, They'll go back, they'll hark back to a famous win over Scotland, Hamden Park in 1987, say, oh, look at the players, they all played for Liverpool, Manchester United, Arsenal, Tottenham, etc. But if, they, if those guys were playing now, would they be playing for Liverpool? A lot of them would be playing for Liverpool, United, etc. I'm not convinced they, will, they would. Whereas guys in more recent years, the likes of Richard Dunn, uh, you know, if he was playing 30 years ago, Richard Dunn might well have been playing for Liverpool or Manchester United, you know. Like that Gary Gillespie was centre-back when they won titles. I think Richard Dunn was a better centre-half than Gary Gillespie. You know, Gary Ablett, he was better centre-half than Gary Ablett. So, you know, it's, it's different eras. Like, we, t- we tend to look back at those guys with rose-tinted glasses because the clubs are paid for but there wasn't anything like the level of competition. Or anything like the level of money yeah. to bring in the players that they're able to now as well from all over the world. And on that cheery note, <laughs> I'll leave it there, Kieran Cunningham, Chief right, Sports no Writer problem. from the Irish Daily Star. Uh, we look forward to reading your work over the course of the next few days as well. Uh, John Giles, don't worry, is on the way after nine o'clock tonight. He'll be speaking to Nathan about all the week's football. But next, we're off to the University Concert Hall in Limerick for our special Heineken Roadshow. It's looking ahead to the Champions Cup with the likes of Brian O'Driscoll, Keith Wood and Ronan O'Gara. It's all on the way next. Off the ball on News Talk. Thanks to Screwfix.ie.